Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to today's session. This is Nellie Deutsch. I'm not Stephen. I'm just going to introduce Stephen. Please write in the chat box where you're from and how you're feeling and anything else you'd like to add. Feel free to use the chat box to chat away. No one can hear you. You can't disturb anybody. Unlike face-to-face uh, -face situations where we have to be quiet and well-mannered, you don't have to be quiet. So use the chat box at your will. And there we've got Stephen with us with a hello or oh, hola. All right, so uh, let me uh, begin by introducing our speaker before I go off to my other computer as Nelly Deutsch. Ah, we've got Don. Good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Good to see people I haven't seen for a while. Welcome. Uh, wow, I'm really thrilled to see some names. Wow, good to see you. All right, so uh, I'll chat later on. You can see Stephen here. Stephen has lots of faces that uh, maybe he's not aware of, but you can see that uh, Stephen's very keen on using technology. I don't know when this was taken. He's a great speaker, and I guess he's also uh, a dreamer, maybe? A little bit about our speaker. The session today is Habits of Effective Connected Learners. And um, if you haven't seen this, uh, Stephen has been working and learning in an online environment, uh, and he's going to be speaking about his reflection on that. So you'll get lots of interesting information. He's going to review the habits he has cultivated to thrive as a learner and researcher online. So today's really about our experiences online. Stephen uh, works for the National Research Council of Canada, and you can see that he's based in New Brunswick in Moncton. I think that nobody had heard of Moncton before Stephen, so the name is well known now. The PowerPoint presentation is available. Uh, well, it will be in the chat. I'll add it uh, later on so you can uh, look at it and get the links. Those of you that are not familiar with the old daily, you should. It's got amazing information and lots of information about MOOCs. Those who don't know, it's massive open online courses. And there's more. But I'm going to stop now and let Stephen go through and tell us a little bit about his experiences. So, uh, Stephen, I'm going to give you the mic. The real Stephen will get the mic, and the proxy will go off. Thank you. And hello. And first, can someone confirm that you can hear me, please? If I can hear you, everybody can. But well, you can see that in the chat. OK, so. that's great. And well, welcome like back from Turkey, Stephen. Um, Thank you. It must have been a wonderful experience. And the weather must have it been It was. Flowers are from Turkey. Uh, yeah, I really liked Turkey a lot. It was uh, it, it's an interesting place to visit. It, there's so much diversity and and so much energy. I really enjoyed it. Uh, of course, I wasn't there during the really hot season. So I'm assuming you can all still hear me. Um, and uh, if you cannot hear me at any point during the presentation, do please uh, let me know in the chat. So I'm here with my trusty chat. Oh, that's great. There he is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so he will insist on spending some time between me and my keyboard, but that's fine. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is get the cat in the chat. Okay, hang on. Uh, hang on one moment. All right. And do you have trained them not to step on the keyboard? There we go. So that that 
but it was hard because he really does know not to step on the keyboard. I'm actually pretty impressed with that. Okay. Uh, all right. This talk is divided into roughly two sections. And the first section that I'll talk about is on uh, the what I call the semantic condition. And the second part is the, uh, the specific habits of connected learners. And I'm doing it that way because I want uh, I want people to be able to see, I want you to be able to see the recommendations for being a connected learner or being a connected person generally in the context of, uh, of connectivism and in particular the qualities of networks. I've left lots of white space in the slides and Nellie, if you will give people permission to draw or type or whatever on the slides would be great. And uh, so I'm going to be asking you to uh, add your, your own unique insights to some of the slides as we go along. We have about an hour, right, Nelly? Oh, we have as much as um, everybody wants, actually, because uh, there's nobody afterwards or anything. Uh, so uh, you, we can extend as okay. you wish. So, you know, no pressure. All right. I'll, I'll probably keep it to about an hour. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, nothing like having a cat while you talk. That's one of the great things about delivering online. I could never do this, like in a live event where I'm giving a speech from a podium. I could never have my cat and be petting my cat as I'm giving a talk. Anyhow, right. So let's move along. So the first part, as I say, is the semantic semantic condition. And the semantic condition, as the slide suggests, is a uh, cat goes with the eagle, people laugh, yes, uh, where meaning comes from networks. And let's think for a second, and here I'll ask you to contribute with text or drawings or whatever you would like, what a successful network is. We've talked over the years, I guess, a lot about networks from the internet, about the uh, uh, train network or the power network or the uh, air transportation network or social networks. What makes a successful network? And I see Helena saying 3,300 attendees. Uh, uh, no seeing slide. You're, you're seeing slide. You're seeing a blank space where you can type or draw things. Uh, happy people collaborating together. Um, or Alexander, if you're watching this on your PDA, you might have just not be getting reception. Um, registered attendees, one with impetus, inspiration, echoes of Stephen Johnson on peer networks. Somebody else is saying connection is being made all the time. And now we're shifting towards sort of what the properties of a successful network might be, right? Um, Mesh connections, one with impetus and inspiration, happy people collaborating together. Uh, think about this. Where does meaning come from in networks? And networks is a, you know, kind of a static or even dynamic, but it's a physical thing. Where would meaning come from? We have socially engaged on the world stage, someone says. A now knows C. So that's the uh, property of transitivity being expressed in diagram form on the slide. Enthusiastic and committed. Is meaning co-constructed in networks? And that's an excellent question. My answer would be no, uh, but the, there's a long, a long conversation to have about that. Uh, cannot write sidebar is grayed out. Okay, so uh, hopefully Thomas, a tech person, will help you with that. Wait a second. What do you mean you can't write? Oh, you can't write on the uh, on the screen. Okay, I get you. Uh, <laughs> give me a pencil too. Uh, love that. Um, okay, enthusiastic and committed colleagues working collaboratively toward a common goal. We'll actually talk about that a little bit. So, okay, I'm gonna just capture this image and try that again without the little pop up. So what I'm doing now is I'm saving your comments and they're going to go on the slides that 
I upload uh, when I upload my slides I always upload my slides and make them available to everyone and what I'm doing now is pasting your comments onto the slide uh, for successful networks so I'm just pasting it I actually put it up. so in the writing that I've done on the topic of connectionism I identify four major principles for successful networks. And so here's what these principles are based on. They're based on the idea that a network can be reactive to input, to produce output, to be dynamic, to be able to adjust and reset itself or reconfigure itself to respond to the world around it. In other words, a successful network is a dynamic network. And an unsuccessful network is one that becomes static, inert, uh, not moving. Uh, we, we would call that network death, right? But what are the properties that lead to networks that are dynamic networks? They're, they're properties that prevent what we call cascade phenomena. They're properties that prevent everything in the network from freezing and becoming inert. And I've identified, in my own mind, four principles. There may be more, there may be less, there may be different. Uh, but these are conditions. They're, they're conditions that should be subject to empirical, uh, uh, empirical validation. I see a few of you are, are putting in some suggestions. Flow, simplicity. Here, here's the first of the principles that I've identified. And oh, I'm sorry, somebody put something, you got to be fast on these slides. Autonomy. So, again, this is another blank slide. And I'm not going to linger so long on this blank slide. But maybe put in some thoughts about what you think autonomy is. And I'm going to pause for a second here. Not really, because there's nothing worse than dead air, especially if you're listening to an audio recording. Uh, yeah, but my, I might as well turn that off. It's not recording. Initiative. Someone writes, why did intro page say 3,100 attendees when in fact there's less than that in the room? 67 people in the room. Uh, Self-directed without boss. Love Latour. Uh, proactive. It's not recording. Uh, is it not recording? What do you mean? Now you not? might want to Who? check that because my my what audio you, recording. What's not? How, how does anybody know whether Pardon? anything's being recorded? I'm. This is being recorded, and I'm also recording and this uh, know. through Camtasia will be on on YouTube without anybody's name. So it's just going to be audio without the attendees or any. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. I was very worried <laughs> because I really like to make yeah, uh, my talks available, and Audacity isn't picking up my microphone. Sound okay, right no, now, it's going to so be there, and you'll be able to download to it because uh, everything I put up is um, CC'd. I mean, it's um, Creative Commons, so that's fine. Sure. So I got a few things here. Um, well, I got three things here. Um, on what autonomy is, and so, there we go. So I'll capture those, even though it's a, kind of a, a motley limited collection of input. Uh, so, okay, there, there's different different ways of looking at autonomy. Um, one way of looking at autonomy is from the independence of your own mind from factors affecting you from the world around you. Oops. Somebody advanced the slide on me. <laughs> um, there, there are different, different factors that affect your mental state. Your experiences, for example, 
the thoughts you have in your head, your psychology or your psychosis. Um, autonomy is the capacity to act or to, to be independent. What's going on here? Somebody, somebody must be curious, but I'm, I'm, okay. yeah, I think, people are I think curious. People, That's good. Yeah. People are curious. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Oh, this sort of throws me off. Anyhow, so one dimension of autonomy are the factors affecting your mental states. And you could not live without these factors, right? We need experience. We need thoughts. Uh, on the other hand, these are things that can limit our autonomy. Uh, you know, if a person has a, a psychological habit, for example, where they always have to go back and check and see whether the door is closed, um, so that's a factor that limits your autonomy. More familiar, familiar uh, autonomy as the freedom or the capacity to act on your mental states. This this is the the type of, of autonomy that people typically think that uh, think of as autonomy. And you can think of the sorts of things that would act against that capacity. Physical constraints, such as being in jail. Social constraints, such as uh, customs, mores, uh, or, or even uh, you know factors like bullying and such. Structural constraints, uh, you know, the, uh, the classes in society, for example. Or resources, if you simply do not have enough food to eat, you can hardly act on your mental states. So... These are, this is another range of, uh, of factors affecting autonomy. The third factor is the scope and range of autonomous behavior. The sorts of things that you can do. Uh, these are the, the typical freedoms that we might find in a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights, right? Freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, freedom of thought, even freedom to choose how you are going to accomplish whatever that you want to accomplish. And then finally, the effect of autonomous behavior, being free to do whatever you want, isn't really very autonomous if what you do has no impact or no effect on the world or creates no improvement in your own life. Now, I, I'm talking about autonomy here more in personal sense, but you should be thinking of autonomy in a more generic sense. These four properties of autonomy can apply to anything and not just to people. They can apply to crickets. They should apply to power stations. They should apply to aircraft, cars on a highway. The idea here is that Networks that are defined with greater autonomy are networks that are better than networks without autonomy. If the nodes in your network are, if you will, slaved to a master node, then the connections between the nodes in your network are meaningless. What makes a network interactive and reactive is that each part of the network functions independently from the rest. Nellie's asking, does everyone know what nodes are? Um, and uh, it's hard to answer that. Um, and people are answering node. <laughs> As synapses. Here's, here's to me what a node is. Anything that's connected to something else. Um, so the nodes in a network might be the neurons in our brain, because neurons are connected with each other. They might be the people at a football stadium, because they're connected with each other. They can talk to each other and interact with each other. They might be crickets chirping and listening to each other in the night. They might be power stations connected on a grid. Anything that can be connected together or are related in some way, these are nodes. You might ask, well, what do we mean by connected then? 
because you know what if they're just beside each other for one thing to be connected to another precisely is for a change of state in the one to be able to or capable of creating a change of state in the other so the connection implies there is a, a relation between these two modes, between these two entities. And well, Alexander something different from uh, I don't know what to say. It's what is different from um, a non causal principle. Uh, for something to be connected to something else, a, state, a change of state in one has to be able to create a change of state in another. Now, if we, we can say things are connected, but sometimes what we mean is things are related or things are similar or something like that. But connection is a physical concept. Uh, it's not a perceptual concept. Um, all right. Still relies on selection of type of edge. Okay, I'm not going to get this track here, but. No. Um, the next principle is diversity. So, what do you think diversity is? Uh, put in your 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 comments here. Your your thoughts. Uh, drawings, text, whatever, and tell me what you think diversity is. Nelly? Yep. People have writing tools. Go ahead, everyone. They Just feel free to uh, Nobody has, get your, has uh, okay, get that's your gonna make pen, it. your keyboard pen, and just right away uh, it's you can do that for people sure. to draw this okay wide ranging sensibility is heterogeneity in in knowledge, uh, it's important to include those whose opinions you don't agree with. You know, screen tools, a multiplicity of different ideas, people with different abilities, variants, a range of views. Points, perspectives, ideas. Um,
Stephen, we seem to have lost your um, your voice, your audio. Can you hear me? Or maybe it's just me. Um. Can I please have a check in the chat box? Can you, everybody hear me? Just uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Thumbs up uh, if you guys can hear me. The thumbs up is in the smiley. Uh, just let me know. There's my thumb for myself. Alfonso, does that mean you can hear me? network then you have a network that resembles a mesh more so than say a star where you have one central point linking to a bunch of other points mesh networks are more stable they're not more likely to all enter into the same state and become network dead so diversity promotes mesh, mesh networks mesh networks that's hard to say quickly are better networks. And we see this reflected in the literature and the discussion. Uh, we, we see, for example, um, Robert Putnam or Richard Florida talking about the necessity for diversity in your experience, diversity in the sources of input, uh, diversity in society uh, to create um, uh, innovative and successful cities and there's a balance though that we need to draw here there's the old saying right birds of a feather flock together and there's a principle of association where things that are more the same are more likely to become connected than things that are different and this is true um, so there's a balance between sameness and diversity we need some sameness in order to create the network, but we need diversity of input in order to use the network. Um, and Guadalupe really makes a good point here. Perspective is not so obvious, therefore the less assumed difference agreed. Uh, we also see this reflected in civil discourse, absolutely. The third principle is openness. What do you think openness is? And man, or, uh, Nelly, if you could give them the uh, the authoring tools again, the uh, drawing and texting and whatever tools, and uh, put your thoughts about openness in the big blank space, the big open blank space underneath openness. And Alexander says accepting inbound connections. Balthus says hello everyone. Hi Balthus. Uh, Sylvia says transparency, uh, valid diversity says is our equality. That's interesting, Sylvia, and I, I'm inclined to agree with that. Free to say what we think and feel without bounds. Willingness. Nelly has given tools to everyone. Please leave it on the slide. <laughs> Welcoming novelties, no barriers. There is no advance, says Guadalupe, without, without openness. And again, I'm inclined to agree. Mary says, ability to listen to others with a concern for their argument and evidence. So again, it's this idea of receptivity, openness is freedom, um, fluidity, 
willing to share to accept and share and connect acceptance that seems to be a fairly strong uh, uh fairly common theme here um don't block be receptive don't prejudge both ways no limitations and barriers resiliency is associated with openness agreed uh using feedback loop to adapt uh, quite right. And what, what Alexander is describing is a network principle here called back propagation. And the idea is the ability to depend on feedback to adjust the connections in a network. Ability to notice the difference and consciously dealing with it, allowing others to be themselves. You can see that two things here there's a lot of continuity in our understanding of openness uh, and there's a lot of people who are expressing that as a value and somebody of course changed the slides now he's going to cancel the uh, uh, presenter tools for everybody including me <laughs> so she'll give it back to me here in a second and i'll get back to our slide i hope so i have no ability right now nelly to Go back to the slide. Are the slides on a timer? No, the slides are being moved by people who shouldn't move the slides. Uh, but that's yeah, it's okay. It's, there we go. Uh, so now we're back to the openness slide. Um, so I'm going to capture this. So you should stop inputting at this point. So and so I'm just capturing this. And again, these uh, all of these things will be in the uploaded version of this presentation. Uh, and I will upload it on my own website. And as well, uh, it will be uploaded, uh, I guess, on the uh, course website, as Nelly said. So openness, Let, let's look now at some of the aspects of openness. And so in openness, in our field, we think most often of open education. And it's interesting to think of the different aspects of openness there are, even in open education, open content, teaching, assessment. These are kinds of open, openness about uh, being receptive to new content, uh, the sharing aspect. Uh, and the communications or interactivity aspect. Uh, this is quite the intro to my first online learning, says Tim, or not. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. If, if this is your first introduction to online learning, you might find this uh, uh, quite the experience because it's not just a video that you sit back and watch. Um, but uh, it's not as interactive as a conversation because, uh, because of the technology and because of the difficulty of having so many people interact in a space like this. Um, here's another aspect of openness that we don't always think of or too much interaction. Well, that's possible too, Tim. Uh, yeah, it might be. It might be easier to digest if I just simply did the talk and didn't do the interaction, but I just like to do the interaction because the interaction is more the point of the talk than the content of the talk. We can get the content back again later, but I, I, liked, I liked having the interaction. We're also connecting learners, digesting late further, I guess. Um, and she's tried that twice. <laughs> Um, open assessment seems like an oxymoron. That's that's a funny thing, eh? Um, open assessment to me is, first of all, making the parameters of the assessment known ahead of time, and then making the process of assessment known so that the assessment actually happens in the presence of and with the full knowledge of the person being assessed, and not only that, other people observing the process. So, you know, like American Idol 
is an example of open assessment, uh, at least to some extent, where you actually have the singers being evaluated by the judges right there on the stage. And, and you know, usually these things are you know, not quite so public. And, uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to watch that happening in public. But there's also the aspect of any assessment involves, uh, I don't want to say a power relationship, although that's very frequently the case, but a relationship where one person is making a judgment over another. And in that sort of case, that seems to argue against or mitigate against openness. And, and so I see the comment there. Um, so experiments in using American Idol for democracy says, uh, uh, says Alexander exactly. So to this slide, and Kathleen has uh, picked up on the point exactly, uh, controlled grouping doesn't work. It's interesting to watch how the connections are made. What happens in an open network where connections are formed freely um, by autonomous entities is that there will be some kind of clustering that takes place. And there are different ways of observing and defining this kind of clustering. We can see in the diagram here on the slide, they've used colors to indicate some clusters. Uh, when we look at these diagrams, you might have one view of the clusters. I might have a different view of the clusters. You know, you see the one on the bottom with some red and a little bit of green in there. Should that be one cluster or two? There are different algorithms for making or for identifying clusters in network. And that, that's a whole discussion in itself. But what I want to observe here is that we can observe clusters after the fact as opposed to creating groups before the fact. And it's clustering is a property of open networks as opposed to group formation, which is a property of non-open networks. Um, how does diversity of intention inform clustering? Well, think about that. Um, your intention determines the entities you want to connect with, right? If you're interested in teaching, you connect with teachers. That set of connections creates at least part of the overall network, and the overall network, when observed, will have some clusters in it. So diversity of intention results in the phenomenon uh, that can be identified as clustering. Um, Strawberry is pointing out uh, those who bridge groups, and I think that's a, a very interesting hail though. Again, I think it's more accurate to say bridge clusters rather than bridge groups. Kathleen says, it's not just affinity. We also cluster because of diversity. Yes, exactly. Um, it's interesting, and Janet uh, and Sokoza are talking about the CMOOCs and the XMOOCs. One of the XMOOCs that really failed uh, was one where the instructor decided that they would do group work and that's how they would handle the numbers and then tried to create groups and that's the sort of thing that in my experience doesn't work very well that's why in the connectedist MOOCs we've always encouraged people to form their own clusters um, or you know, just to allow these clusters to develop naturally rather than trying to organize it. And the result of that is some people form two clusters and other people work on their own. And you have you know, very small groupings of one or two people, or you have very large groupings, and that's fine. Um, okay. A lot of people talked about flow. Uh, to my mind, flow is critical to networks. I, I put it under the heading of openness because without openness, you don't have flow. Without flow, you don't have openness. Uh, there may be four major aspects of flow. Uh, the obvious input and output to a network. And then, uh, as Alexander mentioned, feedback, which is input that is returned to the network as a consequence of output. And then plasticity. Plasticity. Plasticity is a type of flow 
where the structure of the network changes itself. So the, the actual connections between one entity, one node and another might be formed, might be broken, might be strengthened, might be weakened as a consequence of input and output. And there are different ways of describing this. You can detect a healthy network by observing the flow. If there's no flow in a network, it's not a healthy network. It's not able to adapt. It's not able to survive. A lot of people talked about open educational resources when they talk about openness in learning. My take on that is that they are directly related to flow. And I think of open educational resources not as content that needs to be remembered, but rather the medium of communication, or another way of putting it, the information that flows through a network. And I have a talk out there somewhere called Speaking in Lolcats. And basically, it's the, uh, it's the uh, use of pictures and, and text like this as or in place of a word. Uh, somebody just popped up uh, the question, what do you mean by flow? On, on the uh, on the slide and that's a really interesting question and I don't want to say something like the transfer of information or something like that because that gets me into ontologies that I don't want to get into so by flow what I would mean the the ongoing interactions that take place in a network or to be precise the instance of a change of state in one node resulting in a change of state in another node and flow is the aggregate of that happening uh, and if i wanted to take it further i might say uh the the cascade of these interactions where the change of state in one node creates a change of state in another node which creates a change of state in another node that's flow and then even further and we go back to the types of flow that i mentioned earlier where external input to a network creates a you know a change of state in the first node in the network or a change of state in a node of the network results in some output to the world outside the network so that's what i mean by flow and i hope that's precise enough a uh, better communication model than Shannon Weaver, thanks. <laughs> um, um, perceptual change, very precise. Um, and uh, we're going to ask for a reference to Shannon and Weaver. And I'm sure Alexander will provide one because he's the philosopher in the chat room. The fourth principle is interactivity. And there's two aspects to interactivity. And so maybe I'll draw a line. Do I have a line? Yeah. So one aspect is the practice of interactivity. And uh, I can't type for these. So I'll get rid of the typos. And then the, the other aspect is what we might call uh, the effect or consequence of my interactivity. So when people think of interactivity, they almost always think of the first, the practice of interactivity, right? And we can think of all the different ways that we interact we talk we send messages we put butterflies on the outside of our house uh, we put racing stripes on our cars we play games we sing songs etc from ripples to butterfly wings <laughs> for me when i talked about the semantic condition i'm more interested in the effect or the consequence of interactivity. What is the result 
of all of this flow that takes place in the network. What happens as a consequence? And when we think about that, we, you know, usually when we, we start thinking about networks, we start thinking about networks on a very micro level, right? We start thinking of, you know, this thing interacting with that thing, interacting with that thing, interacting with that thing, interacting with that thing, etc. You know, but to me, what's more important is the overall effect of all of these ind individual interactions. And this, to me, is the content of a network, not the content of these symbols or these signals, right? This could be anything. In a human brain, what's sent from one neuron to another neuron is an electrical impulse. But we don't say the content of a human brain is a whole bunch of electrical impulses. We say it's, you know, we'll always have Paris or that frog is green. The content of a network, the semantical content of a network, which is why we call this the semantical condition, is the overall result of all of these interactions. What can you cook from a melting pot of thoughts? Interesting way of putting it. So, here's a bunch of interactions, red or, red or black versus white, and there's no thing there, and yet emergent from all of these black and white dots is, most of you will perceive, an image of a Dalmatian. Let's go back to the picture here I just drew. Influence, can I do colors? <laughs> I don't know if I can color this fast enough. Oh well. Influence is the effect of one node on another node. But emergence is the pattern that comes from all of the nodes taken together. So many people talk about influence, but influence to me is almost irrelevant. What's important to me is emergence, the, the holes that we perceive. So what is emergence? So this is a little example of emergence in this slide. Uh, and you see a whole bunch of little ants. But if you looked at it more closely, or maybe less closely, um, you see the word emergence formed from the organization of these ants. There is a word, yes. The, the word emergence here in this diagram is an emergent phenomenon. Notice the word is made up of little ants. It's not made up of little instances of the word emergence. Right? It's completely and only the organization of the whole that results in the word of the emergence being there. So it doesn't matter whether the ants are dancing or fighting or talking to each other. What matters only is the overall relation between the ants that forms the word. And it's the same. The same is true in networks generally. Uh, your thoughts of Paris or frogs or whatever are the result of the connections between your individual neurons. That's why you don't have a thought, you know, my uh, electron potential in neuron number 4,447,000 is plus one. Um, huh. <laughs> That's funny. The word emergence is spelled wrong in this diagram. <laughs> that is hilarious. I didn't even notice that at first. Um, but that leads right into a second point. Because I don't know if anybody caught that before. Yeah, ants didn't learn how to spell. 
So that's one aspect of it, right? But the second aspect of it is emergence is in the eye of the perceiver. So this comes back, remember, Alexander, when you talk about connecting being in the eye of the perceiver? Uh, connecting, the actual connecting is a physical phenomenon. So we look at this, right? The actual locations of these ants with respect to each other, that's an underlying physical fact. But seeing the shape or the pattern in the physical phenomenon, that requires a perceiver. So uh, we connect to what we perceive then? No, not exactly. What we perceive is the shape or pattern in the connections. So what we perceive, and this is very common, what we perceive here is not necessarily the individual ants, but the word emergence. But it depends on us being the recognizer. Why we looked at this and we saw the word emergence, even though the word emergence was spelled incorrectly, we still saw it as the word emergence. So the idea here is that the existence of a pattern, the existence of emergent phenomena, depends on the perceiver as much as it depends on the underlying physical phenomenon. This would not be a smiley face without the dots being located where they are, but it's also not a smiley face if there is not a human to perceive it as, as a smiley face. There's like we see canals on, on um, Mars. Uh, we see the face of Jesus on Mars, our perspective commands what we see, etc. So, emergence is a really important idea, but so is recognition. And my own philosophy of knowledge, my own epistemology, if you will, is knowledge as recognition. And the, the actual phenomenon of recognition is the presentation of physical phenomena in the world or to our perceptual sense, uh, senses results in the activation of a pattern of connected neurons in our mind. So we see something in the world, we recognize a pattern, that recognition is precisely the activation of the corresponding uh, concept or thought in our own mind. So do we recognize what we can relate to? Yes. And knowledge appropriation is pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I love the little typo and cool. Um, do we recognize what we can relate to? Yes. And more importantly, we do not recognize what we cannot relate to. We literally do not see it. If we can't imagine it, we do not see it. It is simply not there. Uh, Dean Radden's talk is a good source on this. So, that's the setup. <laughs> and my bells are in the background signifying I've already got an hour. Um, but now, the rest of it is going to flow, I hope. The second part is highly connected people. And what I mean by this is knowing that networks are the way they are, the way I've just described them, or thinking that they are. Um, did anyone hear that? Yes, everyone heard that. The sound was coming from my clock. Uh, what does it mean to live and work in a networked world? So I'm going to go through this a bit faster because I don't want to take another hour finishing this talk, but I, I do want to, to cover this content because this is what was promised as the talk. Uh, it's just I really did want to cover the first part first. Otherwise, the second part doesn't make sense. It's just out of context. So the first aspect or the first habit of highly connected people is being reactive. Uh, everybody wants us to be proactive, to take initiative, create something out of nothing, etc. But in a networked world, 
you want to be reactive. And what does that mean? Well, here's one way of putting it. Publishing your own stuff is secondary to reading and commenting on other people's stuff. Uh, uh, other people's stuff. Nelly says it nicely. Reactive is the first step to learning to be proactive. <laughs> I can't imagine chimes and didn't hear it. Oh, you heard it, Tim, but you did not hear it as chimes. See the difference? All right, the sound still hit your ear, but without the knowledge of chimes, you don't hear it as chimes. Um, what does that cat say? That cat says, I'm in your blog, leaving rude comments. <laughs> uh, so, and it's true. Um, you know, and everybody knows the, the person who's publishes stuff on their own but never listens to or never reacts to what other people's uh, comments or, or their, what they say. And it's like they're having a conversation with themselves, right? It's like they're completely cut off from the world. Can't stop it walking in the keyboard. <laughs> so the very first thing any connected person should be, in my mind, is receptive, open. And we talked about open. We talked about the varieties of openness, and that's generally what I mean. Um, Nibs asks, is it because we always want to measure ourselves to others? No, I don't think so. I think that it's because in order for what we are saying to make any sense, it needs to be a response to something. Otherwise, it's just noise. Um, yeah, I don't know how else to put that, but that's, and, and that's why as I give a talk, you know, and, and Tim commented earlier about all the interaction and I gave a talk recently with a back channel in Nottingham and somebody said, why somebody, they tweeted actually, why would I allow my talk to be interrupted by all that back chatter? Because if I just go to Nottingham or if I just come here and just give a talk without reacting to the interaction, um, it's completely out of context. Uh, it's like I'm talking to nobody. And in a very real sense, I no longer know what I'm talking about. So um, in other words, why are we more interested in reading what others write or commenting? Because the basis of our own thoughts, our own idea, is going to be in the response or the reaction to these other people's thoughts. It might be in response or in reaction to the world. That's just as good. Being open doesn't just mean talking to other people. It means being open to experiences, open to phenomena. You know, that's why going to an art gallery is good. It's not because you're there to consume good art. It's there because you're getting new experiences whatever they may be. Um, and yeah, talking to everyone is like talking to nobody in particular. Exactly right. Your content, the stuff you create should be and will be reactions to other points of view. And there's a practical, pragmatic aspect, so they'll read your comment. But secondly, it ensures that what you are writing about is relevant to something, that it's relevant to a discussion, that it's connecting to other people in the network, that it doesn't just stand alone with no relation to anything else. Posting is about drawing the link between their content and your, their idea and yours. It, it's about connecting, not about expressing a point of view. It's so hard to, it's so hard to, articulate that, especially in a presentation where here I am articulating my own views, right? But this presentation we're having isn't about me airing my views. It's about the connection between myself and you and the connection all of you guys form with each other. This content, this slideshow, is the mechanism that we're using in order to create these connections. But what's really interesting will be the knowledge that's created as a result of these interactions. <clears throat> uh, why do some people 
not like criticism, even constructive, because they don't see it as connection, because they see it as a power play. Um, I could go on. <clears throat> Second principle of connected people, going with the flow. <clears throat> Everybody's familiar with the, um, I think it's Robert Frost poem, right? I, I went for a walk in the woods and I came to a fork in the road and I, I took the one less traveled. Fair enough. And I'm all for taking the road less traveled. But it's also about going with the flow. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> well, A lot of the time, it seems like the way to be successful is marketing, search engine optimization, uh, you know, getting yourself out there, um, publicizing yourself, building your brand, and all of that. Uh, you know, in other words, making yourself stand out from the crowd. Um, and these are people we never want to associate with these people, really, do we? Because no matter what we're talking about, it will always end up being about them, right? And when we're in that sort of interaction, it's not an interaction. We know that their objective is to sell us on something and for us to simply propagate their, their thoughts their ideas, their worth, etc., their pet project P, their talking point. <clears throat> we don't want to be that person. Uh, we want to be more in the flow rather than this volcano of content and meaning and SEO and the rest of it. <clears throat> what does that mean? What it means is in a network or in a network environment, what we ought to be seeking out is not audience or followers or, or any of this marketing thing. We ought to be seeking out places where we can add value. Um, in, in business, they actually know this, believe it or not. We, we think of business mostly as about marketing. But when you begin to do business analysis and business plans and all of the rest of it, what you are seeking is what they call market pull. And by market pull, what they mean is a gap or a need in society that your product or service can fill. You successfully network by identifying a need rather than selling a point. It, it's it's about pull rather than push. That doesn't mean you don't have any goals or principles or message or whatever for yourself. You should. You know, it's it's not like you completely um, become subservient to what the other person is trying to do. That's not the point at all. The point here is that your values and goals inform your participation. They don't dictate it. And your values and your goals are not going to be the same as the other person's. So you understand that while you're meeting their needs, you're working toward their goals and objectives but you're also working to your own goals and objectives at the same time. Life is more than an hour and so is the flow. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry about that. that for those of you who thought it was only an hour, uh, I really, really tried. But it's so hard uh, in these online forums, especially when I get distracted. Reciprocity, okay. Um, third principle. Connection comes first. And you might say, wait a sec, what do you mean connection comes first? Well, how often have you heard this? People say, 
I'd like to send more email or I'd like to write a blog or I'd like to post more on Facebook, but I just don't have the time, All right? Uh, again, you see this a lot, you know, learning or in a business context, you know, I'd like to keep the staff informed, but I don't have the time. Or, you know, I'd like to share my teaching methods, but there just isn't the time. Well, to me, that thinking is completely upside down. Um, did I skip the slide? Uh, maybe I put them out of order. Well, okay. Um, we people, we, we hear about people taking, you know, email breaks, cutting themselves off from the internet. Doug Belshaw talked about his black ops. Um, you know, uh, limit your access to email, or when you go to a meeting, turn off your phone, or all of that. And to me, this idea of limiting your communicating and interacting as something you do only when the important stuff is done, that's exactly backwards to me. In almost every field, connecting with others is the work and everything else we do is the busy work. Uh, you look at marketing, you look at teaching, law, uh, even archaeology in a certain sense. Uh, you know, any of the sciences, yeah, there's always some stuff that we do with our hands, but the work is connecting with others, isn't it? And so what is it we're saying when we say we're too busy to connect with others? Uh, we're saying the work isn't as important as well, whatever it else, whatever else it is that we're doing. Um, if you don't have time for reading email, writing blog posts, and all the rest of it, you should be looking at all the other stuff that you're doing, because that's the stuff that is making you less efficient. I mean, not all of it. You know, you have to cook supper, for example. But, you know, when, when you balance, your, let's say you look at your time in an office, and you, you balance the time you spend writing email or communicating like this session online and the time you spend uh, doing what? Watering your plants, sitting in meetings, etc. This is... The productive time is the time that you're doing the email, writing the blog post, posting the discussion lists, and the rest. You know, compare the, the time that you're spending writing email or posting the blogs with the time you spend in meetings, unproductive time you spend in meetings, waiting for the guy to get his slides set up and to make his sound work, compared to the time you spend traveling or commuting time you spend with offline media that you can't even interact with, uh, or the time you spend with telephones, and don't get me going about telephones. Next principle, sharing, which seems to go opposite to everyone's sense of business logic. No voice here for me, says Halima. Really? Oh, oh. Oh, I see. You're getting no audio. Yeah, you'll have to refresh. Although, why am I telling you that? You can hear that. In a, one of my favorite uh, things to say. You know, everyone who's not here, please speak up now. Or like, if you can't hear me, send me a message in the chat room. <laughs> I love doing that. Um, <laughs> and, and somebody always sends a message. I can't hear you because people are funny that way. <laughs> Sharing. This comes straight from um, the seven Stephen Covey's, right? Or I think it's Covey's Habits of Effective People. Think win win. I hate that advice. Because anytime you go into a situation thinking win win, at least part of your mind is devoted to thinking. What's in this for me? And that's exactly the wrong attitude to have in a connected world. When you are interacting, remember, it's about 
finding value, finding the good that you can do for others. So if you're always thinking what's in it for me, you will be limiting the capacity of doing good for others. In a, in a network world, thinking win-win is like thinking the network serves me. Uh, it's a bad way of putting it, but you know what I mean. The idea here is to share without thinking about what you'll get in return. Uh, you know, when I post my newsletter, I don't think about, well, this post will get me three more readers, or that post will cost me readers, or maybe I can sell advertising on my blog, or, or whatever, right? And not thinking about those things makes the newsletter a better newsletter because it's me sharing without reservation. And when I share without reservation, I share the good stuff and not just the stuff I think will get me some kind of return value. And it's sharing the good stuff that is what's filling the need out there in the world. So you share. You share without worrying about the free riders. You share without worrying about taking advantage of your work. Why? Because in a network environment, you want to be needed and wanted. Success in the network environment is being needed and being wanted. You can't have any impact on the world without being needed and wanted. The minute you start thinking about what's in it for yourself is the minute you stop having an impact. Uh, you know, it's... I had an old philosophy professor who, who said to me once, you can create change or you can get credit, not both. And the people who live in a network world create change. And they don't worry about the credit. That's, I'm going to say from experience, a lot easier said than done. Uh, but, you know, you know, it, it's, it's the old Taoist principle, right? You know, the less you think about the reward, the more the reward comes. Uh, the less you think about making friends, the more friends you will have. The less power you seek in the world, the more power you will be given. Um, yeah, yeah, Sylvia, uh, feel free to quote as much as you want, and there will be a recording, of course. Oh, and the paste, yeah, you can copy and paste the chat. Yeah, there's lots of, no, I love this chat. This is a great chat. The chat's more interesting than my talk. <laughs> when you share, people are more willing to share with you. The more freely you share, the more freely others will share with you. To create wealth, give away what you have. Next principle, um, retention stats. It's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, retention stats. You know, for me, one, one of the, the hallmarks for success in any of my talks is the fact that people can leave, and sometimes do, and that's okay, and nobody feels badly about it. That's a successful talk. If people feel they have to be there, that's not a successful talk. Now, now my talk is being undermined before it even starts. So I never worry about retention rates. It, it's irrelevant. And that's true in online learning as well. A successful online class is one that people can attend or leave voluntarily, where people come and people go, where people can try out and move on to something else. That's success online. Bar camp model, exactly. You know, and... and the bar camps existed before MOOCs, and there's more than a little thinking of bar camps in the MOOCs that we created. There's certainly an influence there. Next principle, learning for ourselves. And it's funny, you know, people think, oh, yeah, I have my personal learning network. So if I need to know something, I just type a question on my personal network, and a whole bunch of people will send me the answer. And then they said, you know, I asked this question and I got X number of responses. And my, excuse me, my response to that is, yeah, try that five times a day and see how well your network is acting to you. Um, 
The network doesn't exist to answer your questions. The network will answer your questions, but it's not about answering your questions. You know, one of the first principles of the internet is RTFM, uh, read the fine manual or <laughs> other, uh, other variations on that slogan. And what that means is simply, if you have a problem, the first thing you should do is look for the documentation that's already out there about that problem. 90% of my programming, more than 90% of my programming problems are solved by typing or doing a search on the problem. Uh, if I get an error message in a piece of software that I'm working on, I copy and paste that error message into Google and then access the 500 people who've also had that error and the solution that they used. It doesn't always work. Um, my, uh, my phone, this phone, my wonderful Android phone. Oh, I don't think I've shown this to people. See this here? This picture is uh, Andrea and I were walking on the beach, and she pointed it out to me. It's uh, a sculpture made of sand, um, and it's got you know little blue shells and a big, big white shell and seaweed for hair, and it's so well done. We just ran across this on the beach one day. This is part of being open, you know. Like, if we weren't open to the experience of looking and seeing what's on the sand in the beach, we never would have seen that. I just love this thing. And when you look at it, the more you look at it, you more, the more you realize this person, whoever this is, probably a kid, has captured, really captured human, uh, human figures. Anyhow, or human expressions. Anyhow, this phone no longer connects to my computer. And I've done my searching on the internet can't find a solution for the life of me. Uh, I almost broke my phone yesterday trying to make it work. Um, so it doesn't always work, but try it first. Um, why? Well, first of all, people should make the effort to learn for themselves before seeking instruction. It's the whole principle of being receptive first, right? Um, you know, seeing what others have done. Uh, you know, people who spend the time and the effort to write manuals really appreciate it when you read them, for example. But not, it doesn't, it's not simply respectful to take the time and the effort to look at the work done to document things. It demonstrates competence and self-reliance. It shows that you know, you're, you're not one of these people who has this sort of learned helplessness. And I, I could go on for an hour about learned helplessness. Uh, but being a connected person, a connected learner, means connecting to all aspects of, of the Internet. It means treating the network as a whole as a resource. And learning for yourself demonstrates that you have the capacity to work across these connections and, and find the information that you need. Uh, it's creative, a creative plasticity, if you will. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, and Knives says, we should remember that we can never know everything, even if as a teacher we sometimes think we do. Yeah, I spend more time and I can actually document exactly how much more time looking for the answers to things on the internet than I do giving the answers to things to other people. Uh, even though I share a lot, I share really openly and an awful lot, but all the rest of the time I'm looking for answers to things on the internet, I'm not always following things. And when you read the manual first, or you know, find the information you need, this saves everybody's time. It saves them from giving you advice you don't need. And it helps them focus on the advice that you do need. 
uh, it's not simply we know that we don't really know. It's before we actually look for the solution, we don't know what it is that we don't know. And even if looking in the manual doesn't give us the answer, it really narrows the scope so that we go from not knowing what we don't know to knowing what we don't know. I uh, come back to my phone, not knowing what I don't know. Well, <laughs> what I know I don't know is how to reset the operating system in this phone back to the factory settings so that it will connect with my computer again. That's what I don't know. Um, so that helps me search. I still don't have a solution to my problem, but that's also sometimes the outcome. Framing the problem is often the hard part. So we look for answers to the effect and not the cause. That's exactly it. Um, next principle. Sorry, Joe. Thanks for being here. Um, reset it to iOS and it will work. Well, it's an Android, Bernie. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, if it was an iOS, it would connect with them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, cooperation. Everybody talks about collaboration all the time, right? Uh, that's what people do offline. They join teams, share goals, work together. Everybody speaking the same language, working from the same playbook, uh, marching to the same beat, etc. Online, people cooperate. That's something different. Um, Online, they network. Online, instead of everybody working toward the same goal, people work toward each other's goals and objectives. Do you see the difference here? This is a really important difference. It's the difference between groups and networks. It's the difference between everybody following the direction of one person who will define the objectives and goals of the group and assigned roles and responsibilities, and everybody working in a shared environment for their mutual interest and benefit. Cooperation is about sharing resources where that sharing helps each person in the cooperative network. It's about pooling rather than following. Um, if you think about it, in the online world, communications, everything really, is much more voluntary than offline. Uh, you know, that was one of the very first lessons I learned about being online. You can always turn off your computer. You can always go to a different site. I didn't say website because I learned before. You know, I learned in the world of muds and the world was you can always go to another mud, um, and that means when you're interacting and working with people in an online environment, the dynamics are very different from the dynamics that take place when you're in the same room. When you're in the same room, the force of personality, even pure browbeating, much less uh, you know, the, uh, the dynamics of a workplace environment, can cause everybody to line up behind the same idea, the same thought. You get this idea of groupthink, um, of, of subservience to the same idea. You can't make this work in an online environment. You, people talk about collaborating in an online environment, but there's no sense in which you have the same singularity of objective and output online as offline, simply because you can always turn off the computer. Um, you know, you, you look at meetings and things that take place online. In, a, in an in-person meeting, people are generally paying attention. In an online meeting, they might equally be reading their email or watching YouTube videos or making cat pictures. All of those are just as likely as your meeting. How many of you right now, right at this very moment, right now are reading your email? Some of you. Uh, Online, you can always delete stuff. <laughs> uh, is this because online communication is devoid of social status? Not exactly, but social status has a much lower impact, has much less of an impact. 
uh, power relations are completely different online. Uh, you can't shout people down online. You, you see people try, but all that does is cause people to go somewhere else. Um, I added your ideas to my blog post right now, LOL. <laughs> uh, well, Teresa's paying attention, that's nice. Uh, oh, Zimrat was checking Facebook, yeah. <laughs> uh, Japanese nail syndrome, I don't know what that means, that's new to me. Nelly is here, Teresa's smelling. That's why I like the interaction too, right? The interaction tells me that at least for the period of time you typed your comment, you weren't reading your email. <laughs> Live tweeting quotes. Okay, well, that's good. Mail, Twitter is closed. Oh, that's too bad. Um, cooperation. Like, collaboration is based on standards. Cooperation is based on protocols. A standard is like, is like a, a, a rule or a law. But protocols are accepted voluntarily. You don't have to follow them. That's one of the, remember HTML, that's the language used to create web pages. The beautiful thing about HTML was it could be whatever you wanted it to be. And you would make your HTML page and you'd put it on the internet and somebody would access the page with a web browser. And if the web browser did not recognize what you put on the page, it simply ignored it. And so people can make mistakes with their HTML, HTML and their pages would still work. People could put in their own private markup. They wanted to create new extensions in their browser. The idea of a protocol is that it's open, it's variable, it's changeable, nobody owns it, and it's not even an agreement. It doesn't have that force. It doesn't have the force of an agreement. It's just, it's there for anyone to use however they want. And the World Wide Web is based on protocols, not standards. Um, even at the very lowest levels, you know, the, the actual hardware that drives the communications between one computer and another is protocols. Uh, nothing forces Microsoft and Apple to use TCP IP. Um, but they do, and that's why Microsoft computers and Apple computers can talk to each other. But if Apple made a business decision and wanted to go TCP AP, it could, and it could have its own private internet. Uh, and don't tell me that hasn't crossed their mind from time to time. But so it's a voluntary agreement. Finally. Uh, protocols do compete. Yeah, they, they compete, but it's different, right? Uh, you know, like look at look at RSS versus Atom. Um, the classic case of two protocols competing for you know in the same environment to do the same task. And I don't think it ever was a competition. Uh, you know, it was it was you could use one or you could use the other, and generally things that supported one supported the other, and a system that supported only Atom, as Blogger tried to do, found itself losing ground to systems that provide both. You know, it's, it's a classic thing. What do you get when you create an alternative to one protocol? You get two protocols. What do you get when you create the middle way to find the common ground between two protocols? You get three protocols. And that's the way protocols work, right? You, the, the more you attempt to standardize them, the more you attempt to, if you will, win the competition, uh, the more you get preparation of protocols. Uh, you know, the standard internet protocol, but it was still a protocol. Um, anyhow, engage. This is the final point. This is maybe the most important because Learning, in the end, isn't about receiving signals from people and remembering them. It isn't about consuming content. Learning is about engagement. What do I mean by that? Well, you've already seen my cat. Uh, 
and, and I put in my paper, having a cat can be as important for a physicist as having an advanced research lab. And you might ask, well, how can that be the case? And the point is here that, well, partially communication depends as much on feeling as it does on cognition. It depends as much on the totality of your life as it does on the particular thing that you're trying to say. So one aspect of this is people who use communications only for business, and I'm sure you've heard that, right? I mean, and in your schools, right? Uh, the, the, the school internet system is to be used only for learning, and therefore we have blocked YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all of the rest, right? And what they're doing is they're destroying the communications capacity of the system. If anyone should have learned that, BlackBerry should have learned that when they made the decision, oh, we will focus on the business market, right? And what they did not understand is that 90% of the business market is about personal communication, not business communication. The business communication is what happens after you've established the genuineness and the authenticity of communication that builds trust. You know, once you've traded cat pictures, then you're in a position to do business with each other. Same thing with learning. Learning and communicating are not simply acts of sending content over a wire. They're not about sending content. Uh, you know, we, you know, it's, it's, we come back to this interactivity principle, right? Uh, learning isn't the stuff that one node sends to the other node. Learning is being part of the overall network and being able to recognize the patterns of interactivity in that network. It's what Wittgenstein called engaging in a way of life. To communicate is not to send a signal, it's to engage in a way of life. So cat pictures, says Strawberry, uh, it, it is about relationships. Finding something that starts the trust or engagement. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, and cat pictures have, there's so many dimensions to cat pictures. On, on one sense, it's saying, I like cats. I'm the kind of person who likes a cat. Another way, another sense, it's saying, I like to do things like put pictures of cats on a multi billion dollar communication system. Um, in another sense, it says, I'm nice to animals. In another sense, it says, I like things that are funny. And what's happening is all of these are creating points similarity between yourself and the other person. And where these points of similarity occur, the connection strengthens. It's when the connection strengthens that actual signals can be sent back and forth between you. And then the learning happens as when you slowly become absorbed into and engaged into the same network as the teacher. So that when the network responds in some way, you respond back in roughly the same way your teacher would respond back. But it's you have to become engaged in this network in order to interact with and respond to the network. You know, I, I, I sometimes talk about people learning physics. And Thomas Kuhn talked about this. Thomas Kuhn talked about learning how to be a physicist isn't about learning the content in the front of the chapter, it's about learning how to do the problems at the back of the chapter. And for those of you who have taken physics or taught physics, you'll understand that the problems at the back of the chapter never cover exactly the content in the front of the chapter. They always take you a bit beyond, a bit further. Because what they're trying to do is to inculcate you in you not just some set of facts, but a way of thinking or a way of seeing the world. And, and Kuhn talked about this in terms of paradigms, right? 
And so you'd be immersed in a certain physics paradigm. So becoming a physicist isn't learning a whole bunch of facts about physics. It's about becoming the sort of person who sees and interacts with the rest of the world the way a physicist does. And it's the interacting with the rest of the world that's the really important part here. You know, you look at Schrodinger. Um, oops, is it here? Oh, oh, no, it's back here. Oh, I didn't use the Schrodinger picture. Ah, oh, I tried to use a different picture. Schrodinger, uh, one of his famous examples involves a cat. And the idea here is that he's using the structure and the background of everyday part of his life to illustrate advanced concepts in physics, concepts that he would not even be able to comprehend were he not a physicist embedded in the structure and the rest of ordinary life. Oh, I'm sorry you can't hear, Helena. Um, but I do hope that you'll be able to hear the recording. And so uh, when you listen to the recording, you will know that we noticed that you are having difficulties and it mattered to us. Uh, and there's Nelly putting the link to Schrodinger's cat into the chat room. Um, much left deliberately unspoken redefined patterns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's the way of life that allows us to do that, right? Uh, you know, any sentence will contain far less of the meaning than the person hearing the sentence will understand from it. And they get this understanding because they are embedded in this way of life. Some, a lot of philosophers and educators talk about this as being, as learning being socially centered and socially contextual. And that's right, but only to a certain extent. Um, because it's not limited to being socially connected and socially connect, uh, contextual. Yes, that's part of it, but it's living in the world, not just living in a society that's important here. Um, so when you are engaged, you're not simply engaged with society. That turns you into one of these people who's like building their personal brand and social marketing and all that. You're engaged in the world itself. So you're not just interacting with other people, but you're interacting with trees, birds, uh, bees, animals, cats, grass, whatever, right? And not just in your own neighborhood, but wherever you can go. The idea here is you're engaging in this overall immersive way of life. And as you interact with the community of physicists in this world, you begin to think like a physicist. As you interact with the community of lawyers in this world, you begin to think like a lawyer. Uh, that's where Alan Watts comes in. Yes, that's that's astute and, and exactly right. I read a lot of Alan Watts a number of years ago. The, the common, these common everyday things, tables, chairs, lanterns, cats, uh, football games, um, hating the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> All of these form the overall mental structure, the network of connections that on which we hang the theoretical structure, whatever it is that we're trying to learn. If we're trying to learn that Paris is the capital of France, we already need this overall mental structure that tells us what France is. Those are the principles. That's the talk. Um, and I hope you found this interesting. And if you did find it interesting, there's my website. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I loved it. And I, and I said it in the chat. I really love um, that's my personal opinion, if I can say. I really love uh, these kind of um, conversations where we can use the chat freely and uh, the speaker doesn't get annoyed 
you know, when people, you know, the, uh, the modeling of what you're talking about, uh, Stephen, I really appreciate that. And I think that's something yeah. that and I look for. Not, you know, I look for people who talk There's my website and, and walk the talk. <laughs> And, and you do it and, so, uh, I really so brilliant. appreciate the time you've taken so, um, today to, to be here and be you. patient thank through the whole you. thing. And thank you. And I think a lot of people would agree. So you can see the chat. Um, if you could just add, you know, um, you look what? You're following the. Ch <laughs> yeah, well. My other computer is screaming for con connectivity. It's, I don't know, it's going crazy, but this one seems to be fine at least. So, you know, it's good to have more than one computer. Helena, I know, had some problems. I think that's an idea to have more than one open and then one should, you know, should be able to pick up everything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I hope you'll be able to come again and again and again and again um it's, because you're giving so like much from the screen to all of I'm us. following the chat. if i look like i'm looking i'm following the chat I'm just zipping along there and everyone for that thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. This is being recorded and it's going to be downloaded uh, to YouTube with uh, just the uh, audio and slides, of course. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for um, <clears throat> for joining and uh, for making this possible, because without I guess without the chat, you know, um, well, as you know, um, I always like doing right? these. So, um, it's always a time schedule okay, permits, so of thank course, you. but, uh, thank you know, I, I, you know, this is a part of what I do. This is part of the work and, uh, and, uh, it's probably the most right. important part of the work. So I really appreciate it.